This looks like um, like I'm about to do like a, a little solo here. Yeah. But there's like just one note. So really boring solo. And don't worry, this plant is flood resistant. I, I've been told it's flood resistant. <laughs> oh man. How's everybody doing? All right, you know, when I bring out the chair, you're like, you're in for it, right? You're like, oh boy, settle in, people, settle in. Hey, um, if you've gone out to coffee with me, you know, you've probably been asked this question about, like, your story, because I love hearing people's stories about how they came to be a Jesus follower, and it seems as though these stories almost always start with, well, you know, I met this person. There's always an important, I, I can't really see y'all there. We'll just, we'll play peekaboo for a while here, okay? I see you, okay. All right. There's almost always an important relationship through which the great big welcome of Jesus gets introduced, right? And in retrospect, we understand them as like these sacred meetings, always, just like in the right place, always just at the right time as if the spirit of Jesus had somehow orchestrated it all. So can you think of a meeting? Can you think of a person, a relationship that did that for you? Can you think of that? So today, I want to make this claim that if that person was a domino who tipped towards you, and if you followed all those dominoes back, back and back and back, a couple thousand years back, that eventually you would come to a meeting, to a relationship, a person in the book of Acts. So today, I want to make this claim that if you are a Gentile, which simply means anyone who is not Jewish, if you are a Gentile and you're a follower of Jesus, it is due in part to a third gender person of African descent. Do you know that? Uh, and that was my hook, by the way. Like, I'm hoping some of you are like, ooh, tell me more about that. Um, I know some, some others of you in the room are like, yeah, I've already heard you talk about this before. <laughs> because it is like one of my favorite stories about what the Holy Spirit is up to in the world. So if you are hearing this again, you're welcome because you probably forgot about how amazing it is. So let's do this. Are you up for this? This story comes from the sequel. Thank you. This story comes from the sequel to the Gospel of Luke um, about what happens to the Jesus followers after the death and resurrection of Jesus when Jesus returns to God but empowers them with his spirit. And I'm going to need your help in reading some passages. First one comes Acts 8, 26 through 28. A, um, the, Ryan, the RMV, the Ryan Marsh version. Ready? <laughs> An angel of the Lord said to Philip, everyone together, get up and go towards south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So Philip got up and went. It's a good beginning. No? So Philip, if you don't know, one of Jesus' closest friends, one of the 12 disciples, and he's a Jewish man coming from north in Galilee area. And all these identifiers, these are going to become important as we go on together, okay? But it starts with the angel of the Lord speaking to Philip. Now, I don't know if this is like in a dream, if this is a visitation, or if this is like his intuition, but Philip is given this directive. Why don't you just get up and go? Uh, where to? Just head south, past the city. Okay, uh, and, and then what? Just drive out into the wilderness. Okay, uh, anything else? Uh, nope. So, did you know that God can be kind of vague sometimes? Did you, are, were you aware of this? You need this, this warning label here. And I suspect that Philip, if you're familiar with the Enneagram, is like a seven, like me on the Enneagram, because what he says, says next is, let's go. 
That's all he says, right? There's no plan, right? It just says Philip just got up and went. So you're already getting the sense in this story, like, oh my gosh, what is going to happen here? Something kind of wild is about to happen. So let's read on. Together, ready? Wait for it. Now, now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. They had come to Jerusalem to worship and were returning home. So, first we've got Philip, and now we read about a new character. So what do we know? Put that back up there, June. What do we know about this new character? What information do we have? Ethiopian, right. So um, a Gentile, right? A foreigner to Jerusalem, south of Israel, traveled up north. What else do we know? A eunuch. So let me offer just like a little historical cultural context to this story because um, we don't have like one-to-one -one comparisons here. So in the ancient Near East, there were three ways that males became eunuchs, either by birth or by choice. But in most situations, eunuchs were often castrated against their will. So my friend Eric Mason, um, who did a lot of study on this, uh, writes this. Eunuchs in the ancient world were often victims of violence, sexual exploitation, and social condemnation. Ancient Greek or Latin speakers had multiple words to differentiate whether a male's testicles had been crushed or pounded, torn from the body, or cut out of it. This was frequently done to degrade men that had been conquered in war. So, in, for instance, we see this in 2 Kings 20 and Isaiah 39. Uh, Israel's king, Hezekiah's sons, captured by Babylon, castrated and enslaved in the Babylonian Empire. So eunuchs were often used as sex slaves for the elite, and because they had no family in the sense of you know, in-laws or children, they were less threatening to royalty to have around. But in ancient Judaism, which was intent on fulfilling God's promise to become this great people that just outnumbers the stars in the sky, eunuchs were culturally problematic because they didn't contribute to that expansion. And a man was defined by that culture as one who begets children. That's how one would live on in the world. That's how one would grow their wealth, is cared for in old age, helps build a nation. You make children. So where do eunuchs fit in this vision? Which on the one hand, makes the eunuch in this story a very marginalized character. But we also see the Ethiopian eunuch is also a person of great power at the same time. So, so really, like, a complex character. We read the Ethiopian eunuch is a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. Like, this is a lot of trust. This is a lot of power. And this is why this individual is going up to temple to make offerings on behalf of Candace. This is like a business trip in one sense, right? So uh, this was a business trip. But it was also a personal trip, a spiritual pilgrimage. It says they had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home to worship, right? A little bit more context for you. What do you know about the relationship between eunuchs and the Jewish temple? Have you been... You've been doing deep dive in Deuteronomy this week? No? Okay, well, let, let's do it for you. And um, I'm not sure if, if... Did Sarah preach on this text last week? Maybe not. I'm not sure if she did. I don't think she did, actually. No. Um, I'll just read this one. No one whose testicles are crushed or whose penis is cut off shall be admitted to the assembly of Yahweh. Here's what this means, people. 
there's, you know, there's this long tradition of Jewish religion in Ethiopia ever since King Solomon and Queen Sheba's love affair, right? And this eunuch now has come a long way to worship at the temple. But they can't even go into the temple. It doesn't matter how much money they offer, they're excluded. They cannot buy their inclusion. They cannot even draw near to make an offering. They are completely on the outside. Can you imagine the kind of rejection and exclusion that they're feeling at this moment as they return home? And I know some of us here are like, God, I can't even imagine. And some of us here are like, yep. Know how that feels. Let's read on. Next one, June. They were seated in the chariot and reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. Okay. Now, just for giggles, I think it's fun to see so far in the story what directions Holy Spirit gives Philip. Do you remember? Get up. Yeah. Hey, get up. Hey, go toward the south, toward the wilderness. Okay, hey, go over to that chariot. Hey, go join that chariot. Right? Doesn't it seem as though Holy Spirit is positioning Philip without any explanation, which might be kind of intentional on the Spirit's part. Because think about what reservations Philip might have. It's likely that Philip, like any good, good Jewish man of the time, has a disgust for eunuchs. Eunuchs may have this stigma of unclean, could profane Philip, right, preventing him from going to temple. Think about like all the ways in which the eunuch and Philip are so different from each other. Nationality, ethnicity, skin color, gender, sexuality, social status, economic status, language. Nearly every way possible, they are each other's other. So, do you want to see what Philip does? Let's read on. So, Philip ran up to the chariot Heard the Ethiopian eunuch reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? They replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And they invited Philip to get in and sit beside them. One more. Keep going in that passage of Isaiah. Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? This, this, I think, is one of the most beautiful questions in all of Scripture. About whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this, about himself or somebody else? Do you see, do you all see what the eunuch sees in this text from Isaiah? Imagine what is stirring within the eunuch as they read. Like, this is considered a messianic text, right? About a mysterious character called the servant of the Lord. And the suffering servant of the Lord knew what it was like to be treated unjustly, to be physically violated, to be humiliated. And the eunuch can identify. The eunuch reads... Who can describe his generation for his life's taken away from the earth? The suffering servant of the Lord has no children, and in the cultural context of ancient Israel, the suffering servant is not a real person. And the eunuch can identify. The eunuch resonates deeply with the person that the prophet is talking about and wants to know more. Asks Philip, who happens to be at the right place at the right time? this most beautiful question, who is the prophet talking about, self or someone else? 
because it feels like he's talking directly to me. So I wonder what will Philip say here? Will Philip be scandalized by this association made between the suffering servant of the Lord and the eunuch, the one who isn't even allowed in the temple of the Lord? Let's see what happens. Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, proclaimed to them the good news about Jesus. Doesn't sound very scandalized. Philip leans in. I mean, I can hear Philip saying, yes, yes, this is how Jesus suffered too. God who took on flesh took on your flesh. And then they dug in even deeper into this passage in Isaiah. And I'm imagining, I'm just imagining that like Philip's like, oh, hold on, hold on. You got to hear what it says next in Isaiah. And then he flips over, or I guess it's a scroll, sorry, it scrolls down. <laughs> how does that work? In the scroll to Isaiah 56 and reads this next passage to you. I'll read it to you. Ready? And but put it up there. Do not let the foreigner join to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, I'm just a dry tree. For, I think we're missing something here, maybe. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenants, I will give in my house, in my house, and within my walls, a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. You hear that language? For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Does that ring a bell to you? Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. Ooh. Isn't that remarkable? That Holy Spirit led the eunuch to this part of the Bible. Isn't it remarkable that Holy Spirit led Philip to that place at that time? Isn't it remarkable how much God loves us and the lengths to which God will go to tell us? See, Philip knows this passage from Isaiah because he can still hear it ringing in his ear from Jesus quoting it, probably just like belting it out, as he clears the Gentile courts of money changers at the temple. Philip knew that this, this was Jesus' vision for inclusion in the temple and would become Jesus' vision for inclusion in his church. So yes, the Bible has excluding passages, like Deuteronomy 23. We read it. It's there. It's true. But there has always been the presence of radically subversive texts in the Bible, too. A type of course correction, like Isaiah 56. And my Jesus follower friends, guess which one Jesus is quoting? Here's the end of the story. Together, as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What's to prevent me from being baptized? Also, a great question. <laughs> I'm just full of great questions. They commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized them. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on their way rejoicing. But Philip found himself in Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. And this story ends just as strangely as it begins. <laughs> <laughs> which is only right. <laughs> this Ethiopian eunuch was the first Gentile convert in the church. 
And they paved the way for all Gentiles to come after, including me, maybe you. At this moment in time, the church is entirely Jewish. And they're wrestling with the blasphemous idea that maybe, maybe Gentiles could be included in this thing that God is doing. But they're only considering this radical inclusion because Holy Spirit keeps orchestrating these crazy encounters that the early church, they can't deny it. There's like, well, I don't know. I, I wouldn't do it, but the Holy Spirit's just doing this thing. Can't deny it. So friends, you, you would likely not be here right now if it wasn't for this Philip and this Ethiopian eunuch encounter here. If it wasn't for the tipping of these dominoes 2,000 years ago. So I ask you, how else does the Spirit of Jesus want to keep reaching? How else does the Spirit of Jesus want to welcome? Evangelical theologian Jack Rogers writes this. The fact that the first Gentile convert to Christianity is from a sexual minority and a different race, ethnicity, and nationality calls us Christians to be radically inclusive and welcoming. And I believe that this story is about the conversion of the church. The conversion of the church. Not simply the conversion of the eunuch, because all conversions are mutual. All conversions are mutual. I'm converted to you, and you're converted to me. And I believe that this is a story that the church needs to hear today. Amen to that, church? Amen. Hey, thanks for going on this journey with me.